my job at the International Institute for Learning is to predict the future of project management. The reason is so that we can train the next generation project managers. In order to talk about the future of project management, we have to spend just a couple of minutes looking at the past. <clears throat> to give you an example, many decades ago, I've been in project management for over five decades, I interviewed for a job in a company and the person interviewing me said, he asked me several questions and then he said, do you have any questions of me? And I said, yes, what do you do as a project manager in your company? And he said, I plan projects. I said, what do you do after you plan the project? He said, I turn it over to another project manager that's responsible for executing the project. I said, what happens next? He said, I turn it over to a third project manager that's responsible for shutting the project down. Well, today, it works a little different. Today, we want the project manager to be brought on board at the beginning. <clears throat> but the question is, what is the beginning of a project? The first two editions of the PMBOK guide said that the project manager should be brought on board at the end of the initiation phase. Not at the beginning, but at the end. We would have executives or people in marketing and sales approving projects, and then the project manager would be brought on board, and he or she would be told, here, execute the project. Many times we would have planning committees plan the project with no involvement by the project manager. And everybody assumed that the baselines that the planning group created would always be correct. And today we know that that's not true. Whenever we would assign people to the project team, we never asked them if they could get the job done according to the way that the planning group laid out the project. They assumed that maybe they could. And any time there were deviations from the baseline, we would produce scope changes, not to improve the project, but to maintain the original baseline. How did we define success? Success was defined by whether or not we maintained the baseline. And all scope changes focused on approving the same baseline. There are still companies out there that live like this. This is PM 1.0. So the question is, what is PM 2.0? What does the future look like? I'm going to show you four slides like this. Time doesn't permit me to go into detail on all of these. <clears throat> but on the first one, we now have project managers involved right at the beginning of the project, even in the approval process. We now have project managers managing strategic projects. You heard the panel a little while ago with His Excellency on it, discussing strategic projects. For years, project managers managed only operational projects, not strategic projects. Why? Strategic projects were managed by department managers, functional managers, and that was terrible. You know why it was terrible? Because we would give department managers year-end bonuses based upon the profitability of the company over the last 12 months. If you're a manager and you're getting a bonus based upon profitability over 12 months, when will you assign the best resources to a five-year strategic project? In the last quarter of the fifth year. Finally, we figured out maybe strategic projects should be managed by professional project managers as long as they have the right credentials. 
Sponsorship is no longer being conducted by one person. Sponsorship is now being conducted by a governance committee. And that governance committee can be contractors, other types of sponsors, government agencies. It's committee governance. The day of having the sponsor as one individual is disappearing. Planning for projects today is decentralized. Project requirements are now flexible. They're evolving. For those of you that are managing projects around Agile and Scrum, you know what I mean by flexible requirements. And the work breakdown structure, the work breakdown structure is now bottom-up planning, not top-down planning. When I was a young project manager, I asked my boss, how deep do you want me to go in the work breakdown structure? And his answer was, when you run out of planning dollars, that tells you when to stop. That's not a very good answer. But that told me when I have to stop planning, when I run out of planning dollars. All of that has changed. PMI in the last two editions has finally recognized the need for multiple constraints. Do you know that for over 40 years, we taught people that there are three and only three constraints on a project, time, cost, and scope? You know what the problem is? You cannot determine the health or success of a project from a budget and a schedule. There's just no way to do it. You need more metrics than just time, cost, and scope. And finally, we're willing to admit that there are more metrics. Why did we look at only time and cost? Which metrics are the easiest to measure? Time and cost. Today, we have finally figured out how to measure things like goodwill, customer satisfaction, image, reputation. We finally figured out how to manage and measure some of the more difficult constraints. And therefore, we now have multiple constraints. My definition of a project and my definition of success is different than what's in the PMBOK guide. Make no mistake, I like the PMBOK guide. It's a very good document. But my definition of a project is value that's scheduled to be created. What's my definition of success? When business value is created within the competing constraints. I don't measure success according to budgets and schedules. I measure success according to the business value that was created. Because if you can't measure business value, then why did you work on that project and approve it in the first place? Portfolio committees should not approve any project unless they can show that business value can be created. It's very important to focus on business value. Let's go to a couple more. Project managers historically communicated only with the project sponsor. As a young project manager, I was managing a project that today would be worth over $2 billion US. I was only allowed to communicate with my project sponsor. I was not allowed to communicate with the customers or even the stakeholders. All of that was done by the executives because they never trusted the project manager on what he or she might say to the customers or the stakeholders. All of that has since changed. Documentation, I hate reports because I found that my people on project teams were spending significantly too much time writing reports and the customer wouldn't read it. So today, we're trying to eliminate reports by going to dashboard reporting systems. The future of project management will be dashboard reporting systems. I'll show you that in a few minutes. Today we have significantly more metrics. How long does it take to update a dashboard? 
Most dashboards are updated from Excel spreadsheets. How quickly can you update in Excel spreadsheets? In less than a minute. Therefore, I can create dashboards that are real-time dashboards. And today we have user-friendly software. This morning, his excellently, this afternoon rather, his excellently talked about an enterprise project management office and a portfolio PMO. For years, we believed as a project manager, do not communicate with executives, do not communicate with anybody on a stakeholder committee. They're going to make decisions that are terrible. Today, we believe that all of those people are allies to a project manager. If you provide them with the right metrics and the right dashboards, they will be able to make not just seat of the pants decisions, but informed decisions. When designing a dashboard, it's very important to make sure that the information in the dashboard is what executives need to make informed decisions. Now we're saying, if we know the executives have the right information, we know they're going to help us make the right decisions. Therefore, look at the last two items. The project managers today must have access to the stakeholders, and they must have access to the customers. And their involvement is mandatory, mandatory. All of this is part of PM 2.0. This is what's driving PM 2.0. Stakeholders today are expected to make informed decisions rather than just any decision. In order to make an informed decision, you need metrics. And you must be able to put those metrics in the hands of the executives and the decision makers as quickly as possible. That's why dashboard reporting systems will be the future of project management. The difference between PM 1.0 and PM 2.0 is what we call distributed collaboration. What does that mean? It means communicating with everybody. PM 2.0 is the way that information is shared, the way information is transmitted between people. It's getting project managers to talk to people more frequently. Do you know that most of us today that are involved with PM 2.0 and, and PM 3.0, we believe that PM 2.0 is what we call socialized project management. Because it's forcing people to talk to one another. Again, as I listen to His Excellency talk about the skills needed in selecting the right person, that's critical. We're talking about people skills and the ability of that person to communicate with everybody that's attached to that project. I can buy technology. I can buy all the engineers you want. But it's very difficult finding the right project managers that have people skills. PM 2.0 is based upon Web 2.0 technology. What is Web 2.0 technology? This morning, as I was signing books out there, we took an awful lot of pictures. Everybody took out of their pocket a cell phone. What would you say if I told you that in the future, the metrics in the dashboards will be transmitted to everybody using Facebook, Twitter, and all sorts of social media? That mobile device that you carry with you will become the information source for project managers in the future and for stakeholders and customers. You will be able to input information from any location in the world. Any location in the world. You can input the information. You'll be able to select from a world of applications. 
Last June, I was in Tokyo. I was lecturing to senior managers at Microsoft in Tokyo. And one of the senior managers told me that right now there are probably a thousand people working at home or in their basements designing applications for project management metrics, designing apps for project management. Of course, we're trying to figure out a way to predict the confidentiality of the information. We're worried about how secure the information will be when we transmit it over these applications. But she said that she expects a thousand people to be working right now on designing applications. You as a project manager will then be able to take all of the applications you see here and design your own cell phone, your own iPad, your own mobile device with all of these applications specific to that project that you're managing. The future of PM 2.0 will be transmitting the project data on time from any location in the world on any device. And you'll be able to verify its performance. And because of the quality of the graphics on these new cell phones, you should have no problem reading the metric. And you'll be able to get a large number of metrics like this on your cell phone. That cell phone that you have, that mobile device, will replace a lot of the written reports that we're now spending a great deal of money on. Written reports that nobody reads. It'll all be done off of cell phones. That means wherever you go, metrics will accompany you. Wherever you go, the metrics will be at your fingertips, whether it's in your pocket, in your briefcase, whatever. <clears throat> now let's talk about some other changes that are taking place in project management. Many years ago, when I was still in industry, I was managing a project for the United States government. And I walked into my boss's office. He was the vice president for engineering. And I looked at him and I said, how do you define success on this project that I'm managing for the government? And his answer was, by maintaining the profit margins that we put in the proposal. I said, tell me, do you think the United States government defines success the same way we do? by how much profit we're making on the contract. And he refused to answer that question. The worst thing that can happen as a project manager is when your definition of success is different than the customer's definition of success. What you're going to have to do in the future is have the customer and the stakeholders and you, the project manager, come to an agreement on what the definition of success is on that project. Then, you're going to have to go into your metric library. That's right, a metric library. I'm willing to bet that within the next year or two, most of the companies in this room will have a library of metrics for projects. And at the beginning of each project, once you define success, you and the stakeholders will go into the metric library and select the metrics that you want on that project to help define success. You'll have a choice of metrics. I'm not talking about two metrics like time and cost. I'm talking about selecting from 40 or 50 metrics. Then you'll have to make sure that you have measurement techniques, and then you'll have to prepare a dashboard. What does that mean, preparing a dashboard? On every large project team, you will have a dashboard designer. That's right, a dashboard designer. 
And that person will design all of the dashboards on that project for each one of the stakeholders. A year ago, I was doing a lecture at a utility company. They were installing 3,000 miles of underground gas pipeline in the city. 3,000 miles of underground gas pipeline. It's a 10-year project. I asked the project manager, how many stakeholders do you have? He said, I have 30 stakeholders. I said, do you show them all the same dashboard? He said, no. Each one of the 30 stakeholders wants their own dashboard, and we've custom designed the dashboard for each one of them. Can a large metric library cost headaches? Absolutely. You have to worry about what happens if the customer says, you have 50 metrics in your library, I want all 50. That's very, very difficult to do. You're going to have to convince the customer which metrics are important and which are not. Can we end up with information overload? Absolutely. We can most certainly get information overload. That's why we have to be careful about how many metrics we show the customer. We have to select the right number of metrics. This is a quote from a very, very famous American. He said, not everything that counts can be counted, and not everything that can be counted counts. Therefore, you have to be very careful how many metrics you select. When I was a project manager in industry, I had three information systems. I had an information system for myself, the project manager. I had an information system for my own executives. And I had an information system for government, government agencies and government stakeholders. And everybody wanted different metrics. And we had to prepare unique systems for each one of those stakeholders. Once again, if you want these people, especially government agencies, to help you in making decisions, you have to provide them with the right information. And time and cost alone cannot determine the health of a project. You cannot determine the health of a project just from time and cost. It just doesn't work. We are trying today to determine what the core metrics are on a project. Let me relate it to a physical exam. Let's assume you go into a doctor's office to have an examination. The first thing they do is to ask you to stand on a scale so they can weigh you. Then they check your height. Then they put a thermometer in your mouth. And then they check your blood pressure. Every doctor uses the same four metrics. But based upon your illness, they cannot prescribe a cure unless perhaps you must provide blood work, take an x-ray, a CAT scan, an MRI, talk to a specialist. You see, there's significantly more metrics than just time and cost that are needed to determine what decisions have to be made and the health of the project. Because each stakeholder can have different needs, we have to be prepared for multiple dashboard reporting systems. I will tell you, it's not that difficult to create multiple dashboards. I do it with Excel spreadsheets and PowerPoint. That's all I need, PowerPoint and Excel spreadsheets. We have companies today that do nothing but create dashboards for their clients. That's all they do. They're a consulting company that creates dashboards for clients. That's what the future looks like. 
But there are some issues. There are some serious issues. And let me show you what the bad news is. And the bad news normally comes from stakeholders. Tell me, what would you do if a stakeholder demanded specific metrics that you're not familiar with? What we're saying now is that we're not telling the stakeholder what metrics we're going to use. We're going to ask them what metrics they want. And now we're finding that some of the stakeholders want metrics that the project team is not familiar with. When companies ask me what to do, I tell them, learn how to create those metrics, measure them, and use them. If you want repeat business from that customer, from that stakeholder, then you must learn what their needs are, what metrics they want, and you must report it. I have several colleagues that have published books. One book is entitled, Anything Can Be Measured. Anything can be measured. For years, we were afraid of measuring certain things like safety, health, goodwill, image, reputation, because we didn't know how to perform the measurements. Today, we've become so good at measurement techniques that anything can be measured, anything. And therefore, there's no reason why we can't provide the stakeholders with information on the metrics they want. What happens if you do not understand the metrics or cannot comply with their demands? My answer is, how important is it to you to get repeat business from this customer? If you want repeat business, then you will learn what their metrics are and you will use them. Now we get serious. What happens if the stakeholders disagree on the information? Now as a project manager, you're going to have to meet with the stakeholders to make sure they understand what information is in the dashboard. A year ago, I did a presentation for Intel. And one of the questions they asked me, how do we know whether or not the stakeholders understand the information that's on the dashboard? And I told them, I said, the first time you show a dashboard to a stakeholder, you sit down with them and explain what they're looking at. You must be absolutely sure they understand what they're looking at. Because if they don't, they will not use the dashboard system and things will be bad. What happens if the stakeholders say they don't want to hear any bad news? My answer is, show it to them anyway. I don't believe in withholding bad news. I believe that as a good project manager, you present all news, good and bad. I also believe that people that sit on governance committees should understand and be willing to hear bad news because then they can decide what they want to do to help the project. And now let me show you the worst possible situation. What happens when stakeholders ask you to change the numbers and lie because they don't want to go back to their superiors and tell them the truth? When people ask me about this, I ask them, are you a PMP? Did you sign a document stating that you would abide by PMI's code of professional conduct? If the answer is yes, then you will not change those numbers. You will tell them the truth. But I am finding a lot of companies I deal with now where project managers are telling me in confidence that they're being asked to distort the truth because the people they're reporting to are afraid that their job might be at stake. Very unfortunate.
Item 1.0 was handcuffs. I want to spend the, ne the next 10 minutes with you talking about the benefits of project management. In PM 1.0, we created methodologies for project management. And those methodologies were based upon policies and procedures. Why did we create policies and procedures? Because executives never trusted the project managers to make the right decision. That's right. They never trusted the project managers to make the right decision. So everybody had to use the same methodology. What are we doing today with PM 2.0? We're eliminating project management methodologies and we're creating project management frameworks. Frameworks are based upon forms, guidelines, templates, and checklists. Let me give you a window into the future. Instead of having a methodology, you will go through a buffet line, a cafeteria. And on the shelves, you will have forms, guidelines, templates, and checklists. And as you go through that line, you will select the forms, guidelines, templates, and checklists that you need for that particular project. You will be able to customize it for a particular project. Microsoft does not use the word methodology. Microsoft uses the word framework. Framework gives freedom to the project manager to customize the project management approach to satisfy each individual project. <clears throat> Next benefit, project management will allow us to get closer to paperless project management by using metrics and dashboards. That's what our goal is right now in the United States. It's also part of sustainability. Eliminate a lot of these reports that nobody reads. I know that some of these reports are mandatory, but we're trying to get very, very close to dashboard reporting systems. If you have good metrics and you use them, less time is needed to write reports. If less time is needed to write reports, you save money. And it's always good to save money and give customers more value. With good metrics, it's easier to determine the trade-offs. What are you going to trade off first? Time, cost, scope? With good metrics, it's a lot easier to make that decision on what you'll trade off first. With good metrics, it's a lot easier for the stakeholders to agree on the right target for the project. If you have the right target for the project, then it's a lot easier for the stakeholders to agree on the direction of the project and how it's managed. Again, with PM 2.0, you'll notice that all of this revolves around metrics. With PM 2.0, it's a lot easier to take a picture of the project and determine its true health. What's the true health of the project? You know what's interesting? I teach certification training. And the PMBOK guide has 10 knowledge areas. And yet, on the PMI exam, we only test you on the metrics on time and cost. 12 formulas we force you to memorize to determine the metrics on time and cost. But where are the metrics on the other eight knowledge areas? You're going to see those coming. Maybe not in the next edition of the PMBOK guide, but most certainly in the edition after that. With good metrics, it'll be a lot easier for the people at work on executive committees to make informed decisions 
rather than simply seat of the pants decisions. With good metrics and dashboards, there will be fewer meetings. And those meetings will be more productive. I used to work with an automotive supplier in the city of Detroit. And they went to metric reporting systems. They told me that in the first year of going to metric reporting systems, they saved more than a million dollars by having fewer meetings and less time requiring executives to attend these meetings. And they expect to save at least a million dollars a year, every year, because of better metrics with PM 2.0. With good metrics and PM 2.0, we expect the number of conflicts among team members to be significantly reduced significantly reduced. With PM 2.0, we expect to be able to get consensus and decision making. There are two words that were part of my project management vocabulary that I hated. Those two words were called action items. My definition of an action item is the inability of a team to make the right decision in a timely manner. And one of the things we're doing now is tracking how long an action item has been in the system without being resolved. The longer it's been in the system, the more likely it is that the team members are not managing the project effectively. Hewlett Packard told me that every project team at Hewlett Packard today is virtual. Virtual project management thrives in communication, and dashboard communication systems are now mandatory, mandatory for each project team. I used, to, I used to have project managers tell me, I'm getting a lot of executive meddling. Executives are meddling in my project. They're sticking their nose where they shouldn't be sticking their nose. What can we do about it? And I asked them, are you giving them the right information? If they're meddling in the project, it's because they lack information. If you're just telling them about budgets and schedules, what does that tell them about quality? What does that tell them about safety? What does that tell them about risks? It tells them nothing. Nothing. Executives always ask questions, lots of questions. With good metrics and dashboard reporting systems, you should have fewer questions from executives and stakeholders. Good metrics will most certainly increase your chances of success. There's no question it will increase your chances of success. And this is probably the most important slide. One of the benefits of PM 2.0 using dashboards and good metrics is that it should allow for more global partnerships across the world. Those companies, those countries, those nations that embody the principles of PM 2.0 and effective project management, in my mind, have a brilliant future. A brilliant future. And you heard a little while ago about all of the projects becoming complex. As the projects across the world become more complex, they cannot be managed by one company. The future is going to be strategic partnerships. And those strategic partnerships are going to thrive on effective information. This, in a nutshell, was PM 2.0. Thank you very much.